so it's eight o'clock in the morning on Sunday, December 10th, 2023. It's about 36 degrees outside, probably 38 now that the sun's been out for a little while. But no signs of frost anywhere. But uh, I'm wearing my coat and a sweater uh, just to kind of bundle up to resist the cold. But there's barely any wind coming from the north. It's very clear, very dry, and just calm, quiet. So this area is the old uh, section five, which is the southern middle half of my field. The southern third of the middle half. And there's a little bit of grass growing here. You can see the cows are having a good time munching on it. Um, so I, I got a couple comments about rotating the cows faster or slower given the more or less area so um the the thing that i'm doing right now and um I, I don't know if this is the best way or whatnot but i'm doing it i'm recording the experiment and i'm recording the results so you take from it what you will um so the thing that i'm doing right now is i'm set on a 10 week rotation through the entire field and I've started halfway through, so five weeks to cover 30 acres. I'm doing twice daily moves, okay? If I give them more area, <clears throat> but slow down the moves, so I take more time in an area, but give them more area, like double the area once, day, once, once daily moves, um, it would be the same. And I prefer twice daily moves. That's kind of my sticking point. I'm not gonna change how often I move them. I will change how much area I give them. And the way I calculate the area is I figure out how long I want the rotation to take and so a 10 week rotation of the entire field that's uh, um, 70 days right and so that's five weeks for half the field okay and I plan to keep uh, this this pace for uh, the rest of winter right actually let's see I'm going to do I think two five week rotations before uh, spring comes in March and that's only on one two thirds of the field because I'm going to leave one-third to um, as a stockpile. So that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, and I'm not, like, fine-tuning. I'm just kind of bulldozing through. <clears throat> and the hay should cover the gaps. So anything that they're missing, um, in terms of if there's not a forage or, or what, whatnot, the hay should cover that. Okay, so I'm pretty confident that because the the western part of my field is a lot worse than the eastern part of my field, that... And by putting the hay in the western part of the field, it should work out, at least for now. And um, plan B, the backstop, if I decide to stop grazing altogether, I'll just move them on the, along the western fence and um, just feed them hay. <clears throat> and I have plenty of hay. I can feed them up to four bales of hay a week. And I should have some left over by the time spring comes, right? And then plan C, if I run out of hay, is I buy feed, right? So I have plenty of plans for that um another question that came up a lot i don't want to spend too much time on this uh number 24 boop there she is right there uh somebody commented and said uh, on a scale of one to ten she's a three um three is pretty good in my book this time of year um and i know you dairy guys um look, like think like you think of cows differently than we do in the meat business in the meat business they're incubators <clears throat> the job of the cow is to give birth and to milk that young calf for the first three or four months. That's it. That's all we care about. We don't care about their body condition. We don't care about their general health. Um, I, I know this sounds really harsh, but, you know, we're only optimizing for one part of the equation, and that is getting a calf and having that calf survive. That's it. Um, so if our cows are fat, um, we know from experience <coughs> that extremely fat and obese cows don't do well at that equation. We know from experience that extremely thin and skinny cows don't do well at that equation. Uh, the target numbers that we want um, for the 1 to 10 scale I think is a 5 or a 6. 4, 5, 6. And then a 7 and a 3 are kind of outside of where we like them. Um, 2 and an 8 are way out of bounds. And one and uh, nine and a ten are extremely bad. So if we had a cow at a one or a two, 
then we start taking uh, positive action. So if you come out here to East Texas and look at the cow-calf operations that are running, you will see a lot of cows that look like 24, okay? And it's not really that big of a deal, right? Um, if 24 were any skinnier, if I started seeing the ribs poke through or um, some other signs that she's really losing weight, that's when we'd probably take action and get her to the sale barn or uh, put her on deworming medication or feed her nutrients or something. But what's probably happening with her, just so you guys know the life cycle of cows. So the the cows, they their teeth wear down. And my understanding is they grow back to some degree, okay? But eventually their teeth get smaller and smaller to the point where they just can't eat grass anymore. And at that point, they're unable to get enough food in their belly and they just basically fall over and die, okay? So, and it's sad, you know, but that's kind of what happens and we're not gonna force feed them. Um, if they can't survive on grass, they can't survive. And uh, so when, if 24 would degrade much from this, and probably in winter, I'll let her get down to a two. But if she degrades much more than this, then I gotta get rid of her. Oh, she's making some manure so we can see her patty. By the way, her tail, it has caked on manure a little bit, but it's really not that much. Let's take a look at her manure patty. Yeah, that's not too watery. That's soft. It's probably a little softer than I'd like, but it's not watery. So anyway, um, okay, on to the topic at hand. Um, so I, I did that video about morality. And one of the things that I was thinking about is like, I really don't care about morality. And I, I don't think that, like it's an academic topic. It's like interesting as a metaphysical concept um, that, you know, it, it's important, I guess. <clears throat> but, and I've kind of always been puzzled why Christians obsess over morality. Like, why do we have to um, analyze and compute uh, what the best course of action is, you know? <coughs> the reason why I say this is as Christians, shouldn't we be entitled to the gift of the Holy Ghost that will tell us all things what we should do? that will bring all things to our remembrance, that will comfort us and guide us. If we're plugged in to Christ, then we have direct access to the very author of morality himself, God, right? And the Holy Ghost is promised to those who are um, in communion with Christ, right? And so I've never really... It, morality is something that atheists like to talk about, it seems. Like, they're always worried about whether such and such is a sin or not. When, when as a Christian, I'm kind of like, I kind of don't care. It, it's not relevant to me in my daily life. Um, the, the two things that really matter for me is, am I living with complete trust and faith in Christ? And the second part is, am I turning back to God? Uh, because I already know, as a man that the day I die, I'm still going to have things in my character, in my essence. I'm going to have thoughts, words, and deeds that aren't in sync with, with God. And when I'm not in sync with God, that's sin. Jesus, See, Jesus set an impossibly high standard for moral behavior. He said things like, it's not enough just to not um, you know, commit adultery. If you even think about committing adultery, if you even desire to commit adultery, that is a sin. He says it's not enough to not murder. Um, if you even get angry at someone and want to call him a name, that's sin. That disqualifies you from eternal salvation, right? And so that's the thing that Christians are doing is, is we're, we're stressing about the most stupid and inane and pointless esoteric concepts of morality um, that... I don't even think atheists even comprehend what's going through our heads. Um, so I don't even think non-Christians understand what we're worried about, right? When Jesus said that in the last day, he's going to take the righteous into him. And he says, hey, you fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was in prison. You took care of me when I was sick and things like that. And they're going to say, when were you sick or naked 
or hungry or in prison, right? And he says that in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And then he casts the others into, into hell. And he says, you didn't visit me when I was sick or in prison. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. And you didn't feed me when I was hungry. And they say, well, when did we see you hungry or sick or naked? And he says, in, in as much as you didn't do it to one of these of these, you didn't do it to me. And so Christians have this impossibly high standard of behavior that makes any discussion of morality pointless, right? And, and you know, we often talk about John Calvin as he's the guy that tells every Christian, it doesn't matter what you do, it's not good enough. It never will be good enough. And that's true. That's absolutely what the Bible says. There's nothing that we can do to please God. The only thing we can do, the only thing that deserves, that God rewards, is us putting our trust in Him. That's it. That's what Abraham did to deserve all those blessings. So that's kind of my Sunday morning message for you guys. Uh, if you want to debate morality with a Christian, um, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> Because we're talking about morality at a different level than you are. And we're considering things as mortal sins that you wouldn't even consider a sin at all. In fact, you'd probably think it was good. <clears throat> um, and, you know, the depravity of sin, like we, we equate the smallest, tiniest sin. Like we say, even if there's a speck of sin... That'll keep you out of the kingdom. You have to be completely pure and clean. And there's only one way to do that, through Jesus Christ. So, and I'll just share this. It's, it's kind of a personal story, but my mom uh, was a saint. Uh, not in the Catholic sense, but, you know. Um, <clears throat> she spent her life taking care of her kids. Uh, she sacrificed all of her energy and time. And I never once, I, I can't really imagine what her free time would look like if it wasn't helping somebody or something and um you know she suffered persecution for doing things like that and basically lived the the christian lifestyle that you'd expect every christian to live and is a model of example you know for people and on her deathbed as she lay dying of brain cancer and this is fairly private but um she questioned me and she said <clears throat> Am I going to make it to heaven? And um, I knew what she meant by that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get emotional. <clears throat> but that's the only thing we care about. That's the only thing that matters. Are we going to make it? And we know that there's only one way to make it. And it's for us to show up at the throne of God, have a bright, vibrant remembrance of all of our sins, and then have Jesus step forward and say, you've been forgiven. My righteousness is your righteousness. My sacrifice is your sacrifice. That's the only way that any Christian is ever going to get into heaven. There's not a single one of us, except those who are deceived, who think that their actions and their, their ability, their goodness matters. Even in the slightest, it doesn't matter. And so why do we do these things? Why do we wake up in the morning and go out and look for the poor and the sick and the hungry? Why do we break our backs working for other people to make their lives better? Sacrificing ourselves. Why do we do that? It's because that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's it. That's the sum total of Christian morality. We're out there doing good things, not because it's good, not because we want to, but because Jesus wants to. And so don't you dare ever tell a Christian to stop practicing his religion in front of you. <laughs> you will not like what you see if I ever stop practicing my religion in front of you. So that's something to think about. And that's why the question of morality, to me, I guess most Christians, is kind of a moot point. It doesn't matter. All right, guys, have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.